Best Book Bits podcast brings you Ed Andrew, a successful entrepreneur who's built four different companies on three different continents and grown to eight-figure revenues. Author of the book, Golden Ticket to Your Dream Job, host of the podcast, Human Impact, transformational coach, business strategist, and really nice bloke. Ed, thank you for being on the show. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to today. Great. Me too. As a fellow podcaster yourself, I know how many episodes have you done so far? It's coming out for 150, I think. Yeah, wow. I've listened to quite a few and they're really impactful as well. Your story is amazing. I want us, I want you to take me back on your journey as a, a barrister in London in the mid 90s. How did your story unfold from there? Oh, there you go. Okay, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be brief for your listeners' benefit. So yeah, I always only ever wanted to be a lawyer. In England, we have a two-tier system, barristers and listers. The bar barristers, the specialist. We do a lot of the, uh, the litigation and the high-level expert advice. Anyway, I always wanted to be a barrister. I like debating probably. So I went off and did that for a couple of years. I really enjoyed it. It's very much still in my DNA, but I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So probably the first, so I'd spent my entire life until the age of 24 pursuing one particular dream, which was to be a barrister. I nearly went into the wine trade because I really loved that as well. But anyway, I was advised by my grandparents. That was a stupid thing to do, bearing in mind you got a law degree. I don't know if it was or it wasn't, but anyway, <laughs> we'll go on from there. Anyways, the first time in my life I had to say, what am I going to do with my life? This is the, I thought I would die age 90, still being wheeled into a court somewhere, probably. I was so passionate about it. And, and I decided I didn't want to do it anymore, simply because the one thing I wanted to do, I wasn't able to do in that domain, which was arbitration mediation. It didn't really exist only 30 years ago. It was a tiny market. So I thought, well, I'm not going to be mediocre. I'm going to go and do something else in my life. And I had no idea what that was going to be. Like many people, like, well, how do you change careers when you've only been focused on one? And so I went and spoke to as many people as I possibly could for about nine months. And obviously in the UK, being a young barrister has a lot of kudos, a lot of prestige. We have the wig and the gown and we're seen as being a lot, rather like a surgeon, well-respected. And here I was, I've just thrown that all away. <laughs> what am I going to do next? It was all down to people. So I met this firm of headhunters in London and they were ex-bankers. They're all very successful people like me. In fact, some of them more qualified than me. Marine biologists, all people who've done different things. But the commonality is we like people and we like research and we like inquisition and the high level of headhunting those days, and we were doing with investment banks and people making millions and millions of dollars a year. It was about our ability to understand them and their drives and motivation, also find out all their weaknesses. And so that natural style of interrogation, I guess, as it was then, led me into that world. But these were, most importantly, they were really good people. And that's what I was looking for. I wanted a home, because barristers are self-employed, right? We do everything for ourselves. I wanted a home which was small, where we had that autonomy and independence. So anyway, that took me on that journey. I did that in the UK for a few years, but I had this, my father had died and I just wanted to get out of England. It never really suited me. I felt that I, there was something else calling me in life and that the way I was raised in England wasn't going to allow that to happen in my own mind. So anyway, I went off to Australia, set up a business the day after 9-11, had my first client meeting in London where there were no planes flying and my clients, we were talking about, was everyone still alive because they had offices in New York? Fortunately for them, they were. So very surreal. I came to Australia knowing one person who I'd never met, but had a contact. I did that was 21 years ago, landing in Sydney to set up a business, which was a headhunting business, which I was very successful. We did that in over 30, 40 countries around the world. I sold that 12 years. That market disappeared. So it's another example of a business where incredibly successful for a period of time, but that market just no longer exists for what we were sending people around the world. It just, it's a very different world now. So then what are you going to go and do again? And at that time I was very interested in technology and software. And I thought, okay, I'll build a marketplace a bit like Seek or a monster in those days to how to put people together, but using the inside of a head on So making more granular. Anyway, went off to London, built a SaaS company, a lot of critical acclaim, no revenue. So we closed it at enormous expense. It was self-funded. So it was my cash and my co-founder, who's one of my oldest friends. Came back to England, came back to Australia with a very young family, having taken them from Australia to the UK for two years. And what am I going to do? So again, what am I going to do with my life? I'd always 
pursued passions and people. And I think one of the things about the tech company is it wasn't a people centric, like we're a tech company. So we built software. I didn't talk to people. And actually probably what I enjoy most is resolving people's problems at a face-to-face -face level. I don't, solving them technically through software is probably not what I'm wired to do. So it's interesting. Came back into the Sydney tech scene, got involved heavily in, in the tech startup world, made some investments, find out I had cancer six months later. So that was a really good one. Lose a lot of money and then get cancer. It's just what you want when you're 42. So I put everything on hold. I fired all my clients and said, I need to literally the day after. So I got the call from the doctor. It was something tiny. It was never going to kill me, but mentally, it it was destructive, particularly having closed a business. My wife said, are you going to be okay? I said, just give me tonight. I just need tonight <laughs> just to wallow in my pity for a little bit. Next morning, I got on the phone to my doctor and said, how do I get rid of this? So I went down the path of Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese energy medicine, because Western medicine wasn't going to do anything because it's too small. And basically, I had to re-engineer how I thought about life because I'd obviously inflicted this on myself by incredible amounts of stress, running a co company with a young family and all the rest that goes with it and losing a lot of money. So then it was a question, well, I only really want to work with people I like. And a lot of people I worked with, I didn't actually like that much or respect where they were going. So I did, I consulted for a little bit in Sydney and then my wife was a fashion designer. So we, she wanted to grow a business. I thought, well, I'm not sure what I want. You want a fashion business. I'll grow the business. We went to Bali with our two young children. So that's the next move two years later. For, for my health to, to heal, because Bali is a beautiful place, spiritual place, and, and to grow a business because we had factories in China and India and uh, Indonesia. And in fact, it's one of the most fun things I've ever done because I love going to factories, seeing how people work, talking to them, touching the fabrics, seeing an idea to solution. It was, a, it was probably the most fun I've had in many of the businesses I've owned. Anyway, we made a decision, like many people who own a business together, we're either going to stay married or we're going to have a business, but we're not going to have both. So we opted to stay married, put this down to, my wife actually said to me a few years ago, she said, I really only wanted to do it myself. She said, you didn't know what you wanted to do. So you imposed your money and yourself and your will on me. And I actually, I did it because I knew you were struggling, but I didn't really want you to do it. I wanted this was for me. That was a bit of a shock when she revealed that. It's like, okay, she's absolutely right. I didn't know what I wanted. So I attached to some idea that I could be helpful and I loved it. It's not what she wanted. Anyway, we then came back to, we went to France for a little bit. Then we went to the UK, did some leadership consulting over there, which was quite fun and came back to Australia again, about another two years. later. I just went there, explored that. But my little one that was had chronic asthma and it was, I, even though I'm English, I haven't lived there for 20, 20 years, Michael, and my network's actually not there. My networks are here. So going there and trying to build a new business in the UK wasn't easy to do. And we found that Australia actually suited us better. And uh, anyway, so we came back here again. What am I going to do now? And led me to building this program and course and writing, which is okay. I've got all this knowledge. I've had to re-engineer my life. I spent my entire life helping other people solve their problems. And I was talking to a friend who was 20 years young. She said, if you don't share your knowledge, it's completely useless. And I thought, okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write a book about how to land your dream job. Cause I used to be in head hunting, but I haven't been in that space, you know, for 10, for a decade. So I thought I'll write the book and be done with it. <laughs> no one will ask me the question again, but, and it's true. Cause it's quite technical. You've read it. It's philosoph philosophical, but it's also quite technical. If you really want to be the best applicant in the interview process and it holds through today, there are certain things you've got to do. And if you don't do them, it's just not going to happen for you. And it, the things which most people don't share because they don't have that information. So I thought the headhunters and recruiters, they all have their own agenda because they want to get paid to put you into a job. They don't care if you've got two or three other roles going on, it's going to unsettle them because their chance of getting paid is going to be reduced and diminished. And therefore they're going to be less invested in you, or they might be too committed or overcommitted and not necessarily tell you the full truth of what you're getting yourself into. So I wanted to lift the lid on the world of this mysterious mythical world of headhunting. And also give an insight into you've got to take control of your own life. Don't give your don't give control of your life to somebody else, which is what we do when you're looking for a job. If you put it in the hands of other people, you've really got to 
you can get advice and guidance, but you've got to understand they have an agenda at play. Some of them are excellent. Some of them are awful. And you've got to understand who's going to be good and who's going to be bad and who's going to help you. So that was the, I really enjoyed writing. Like I always used to write. I don't, you, Michael, you're a writer, you're a writer, right? Yeah. One of the reasons I wrote my book, Success in 50 Steps, was to put an end to personal development because I researched it for over a decade, did 500 book summaries. And that's where Best Book Bits spawned. But for me, writing that was finishing the research on personal development and uh, everything to do with success. And like you said, with headhunting, you wanted to put it behind you. I know ex when you said that, I know exactly what you mean by that as well. But yeah, lots, lots to, lots to unpack what you said. So barrister, traveling, cancer, marriage, health, business, headhunting, risk, chance, money, such a journey and a life as well. I do have one question though. Why Australia when you first moved to Australia? What was the reason? One of those things. So I was sitting in London and as I was thinking of setting up my first business, I thought I've only done the very high level executive search. We get paid a fortune to do this. I want to see the other end. I really want to see the dirty side of it, the churn and the burn. So I went and took a job with someone else for six months just to see this contingent side where, you know, they only get paid on success. Whereas ahead on you get paid regardless. So you've got to succeed, but you're getting paid to do all the work. And there's an Australian girl in the lady who's also an ex lawyer. And she said, Ed, we're talking about what I want to do. She said, no one does that in Australia. It's never been done, right? In terms of what I want to do. So I thought, okay, as I say, my father had died. I had some money in my pocket. I thought, and I was not happy at all. I was pretty miserable with life, mainly because of that. But I also didn't know what I wanted to do. My passion as a barrister had gone and headhunting was fun, but it wasn't really, it wasn't inspiring me. And so whimsically, I spoke to a couple of clients who were global law firms. And I said, this is what my idea is. I said, sure, well, if you do it, we're with you. So I literally got on a plane, booked a flight, came to, I'd always had a, an interest in it being here. My father always wanted to come here. He spent some time here. My brother had spent some time here. So I got, and I wanted to get as far away as I possibly could from England, to be quite honest, right? 10,000 miles is a lot of distance. And I came here and I fell in love with it. It's just, it, I think for many people from the Northern Europe, it offers us the freedom I think at a spiritual level, even if we don't necessarily know what that is, that we just never get there. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And we'll go back and forward between your journey and your stories as well. Just want to untie the thing. So is it the human consultancy business that was founded, uh, was the next business that you did? So, then, so when we came back five years ago, yeah, the human consultancy was sort of founded to solve many different problems. And like business is a journey of iteration, right? So what am I going to do? These are things that I've had to map out. And this is what I teach now, right? Here are all the things which I'm good at. Here are the things which I'm good at and I'm interested in. And here are the things which I want to learn more about. So if you look at your book of personal development, right, is that curiosity to continue to learn. And I was in that hyper growth phase. Hence the podcast, right? Because I wanted to learn from as many people and share and talk and also see where do I sit in the matrix of all of these transformational coaches, people like Jack Canfield who wrote Success Principles, Chicken Soup for the Soul, and his uh, co-author, Mark Victor Hansen. You know, where do, if I talk to them, where's my knowledge base going to be against their knowledge base? And I discovered it was exactly the same, <laughs> right? This is that their weapons are marketing. I wasn't. So the iteration was I've always had I like business. I've always been an entrepreneur, right? And I like people and I've had a very successful career in the world of careers and the recruitment and headlines. So how do I take that knowledge and apply that to something that I can share and teach? And so there's very, so the human consultancy was set up to do that. But the reality with that is that if I was going into the corporate world, then I think a brand such as the human consultants is a strong brand. Now, everyone said that the branding, the logo was very powerful, but I didn't want to do that. I actually wanted to go and talk to you, Michael, or whoever it must. And that's not in the corporate world. That is very much talking to business owners. So what I want to do is blend all of my knowledge of business with how do we change our life? Because as you would have spoken to authors, public speakers, many people, get to a certain stage of life and you might be 20 hitting that stage. You might be 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, where you're getting all this information, you're not happy with where you're at. So how do we change that dynamic? But also we need to earn money to support our life. Like we can't kid ourselves. I love 
I'm going to segue a little bit here. I love all the stories of these young women, mainly young women, doing van life around the world. And the reason I love that is because it shows courage and freedom and autonomy. They're just going to, they're not necessarily sure what they want, all of them, but they're going to chase a dream. And they're going to remove themselves from the convention of the world to chase that dream. And I think that's very powerful. They're in between stages of life. So I'm going to go and explore. And I think that's such an important part of what we do and something that we miss. Hence, coming to Australia, going to Bali, going back and forth is that constant process of exploration. So to answer your question, finally, I decided I don't need a brand. I just need to be me. Like all of the major coaches or training businesses, you've got even Marshall Goldsmith, you've got Marshall Goldsmith training, you've got Tony Robbins International, you've got Jack Canfield training, is it needs to be me. Like it, people are coming for the problem that I solve, but I'm the person who solves the problem. Yeah, absolutely. We have a similar day to day business consulting, podcasting, reading, educating, sharing. It's a beautiful thing. And I get, I guess you get to a point in life where I'm only starting the journey and I know you're trying to encapsulate the journey you've had. You've had such a, an amazing couple of decades uh, working with businesses and, and crazy companies as well. Um, you advise the Fortune 100 CEOs, world champion athletes, veteran startup founders, professional coaches, leaders, and all that kind of stuff as well. What's some trends that you see or what are some of the things that make these people in the top sort of 1% of their field or what are some of the strategies or tactics that you help them out with or some things that sort of my listeners can take away with? So what are some of the common things that you see? It's interesting. I mean, you can unpack, like there are podcasts you can listen to unpack the top thousand leaders on the planet. There's actually, there's a guy who's, who I, and I don't normally share other people's podcasts. There's a guy called Corey Poirier. You might've come across him in Canada. He has this thing called Business Life University. He's interviewed, I think, 7,000 people. And, and I'm not going to plug it. Anyway, I'll leave it. But the point is, so you can go and unpick the, the attributes of these highly qualified people at a technical basis. What I'm more interested in that is how do we unpack it at a human basis? And when I look at all of them, the reason they've got to where they want to be is drive. Like they're generally running to something or they're running from something. They don't necessarily know what that is. And this is the interesting part of where I get to work with them because in the case of the Fortune 50 CEO, highly successful as a business leader. However, his challenge was that he never built a network because people come to him, so he didn't need to do that. So I said, oh, okay, let's unpack who the people are. And it was very few people, but he never had to ask for help because everyone was always selling him something. So that was, developing a network is, is very important. Otherwise, in his case, when you lose your role, you've got nothing, right? So one of the, one of the I guess, the criteria is they've developed good networks, so they generally know how to ask people for things. So there's a lot of drive, but generally they're also running from something. We look at, when I start to work with them, what is the generally unresolved trauma that's led them to this incredibly powerful, high charging life. Like you look at Oprah, she, her clothes was a Hessian sack. She never wanted to wear that sack again. So generally they're driven by something they experienced in their childhood. What happens is that the mission they set, which is I never want to wear a Hessian sack before. I never want to be abused again. I never want to see a, another alcoholic or even though I'm incredibly smart, I never wanted to go and be a doctor. Actually, I wanted to be a painter. Like these things it doesn't really, it doesn't have to be, when we say trauma, it doesn't have to be a high level of abuse. It's just that to them, they're not getting what they want. Their emotional needs are not fulfilled. And so it drives them to move out of that or, and generally they stay attached to it. So the further they run from it, we have these principles in, in what I teach, but it comes from Tibetan Buddhism called the three obstacles of life, attachment, aversion, and lack of knowledge. So we push away from the thing that we want to get away from. But in pushing away from that and not wanting to be part of that, we're attached to the notion of that. And so we're always held back by what we're trying to run away from. And eventually it trips them up because they have these highly successful careers, which no longer fulfill them. They don't understand why it, and it's very frustrating. Why does this highly successful career no longer satisfy me and I'm wealthy or whatever it may be? Because they haven't set a new mission in life. They haven't realized that the little boy or little girl they're running away from, they did a long time ago, but they never stopped. 
And so now the passion and the energy is dissipated and they don't know how to rekindle it. Yeah, it's I like what you said, drive to people either drive into something or they're driving away from something as well. And trauma does the un, undisclosed or undiscovered trauma. You might get to a stage later in life and you realize, hey, what you were running from is no longer chasing you and you could have dropped that burden a long time ago as well. Let's touch on a little bit about your trauma and, you know, going through cancer and you're basically changing your whole paradigm and your foundation as well and moving to, to Bali. And I've heard you say once before that you went to see a shaman and he said your cancer was a mental thing, not a physical thing. Do you want to expand on that and tell us a little bit about how your life shifted in an instant? Yeah, just I'll answer, the, I'll answer that, that last part first, is that in Chinese energy, they believe that prostate cancer, which is what I had, and is an emotional illness it's not a physical illness in other words it's a blockage in our chakra system from our head which is our logic center as men into our reproductive system and so they believe that it's a blockage and the blockage can be removed energetically so that's why they say you're not sick it's just you're basically sick in the head not in the physical body so we need to relieve it doesn't mean it won't it it might there are cancers can kill you obviously so you, you still got to remove the blocks so the interesting thing is, is that in my 20s, I recognized that there was something greater than me in this universe that we live in. But I was brought up English boarding school boy, very traditional childhood. But I had exposure to some things we should like. My grandmother was a, she was an American philanthropist. She was, she was a, a Rockefeller Vanderbilt at one stage. So she's married into the most old school American families. But she had this very whimsical, this fairy spirit. And, and so you saw this, my grandfather was a neurologist. He was a professor at his own hospital. So it was very scientific. And then you had this very whimsical person. And I think what interested me is what else is going on out there? So in the, my twenties in England, I started doing things like Tai Chi, just practicing. And I started beginning to feel, not think, because I'd spent my life thinking, wow, there's something pretty cool going on here. I've got no idea what it is. But I'm drawn to it. So going back to your question about Australia, I think I was naturally drawn here as well as a place to emotionally grow, spiritually grow in whatever context that is. Because I'm not religious, never have been, but I'm curious. And I think from that perspective and that journey, when I had that diagnosis, I knew, okay, there's a whole world out there which I can explore and I'm going to do that. No, I'm not going to wait a second longer. And the Chinese, they, you know, I had two businesses in India, so Ayurvedic medicine, I would go and get a massage from a healer. That's their practice. So I'd always been immersed in, in Australia. Our proximity is to Asia, which is experiential. It's not to America and Northern Europe, which is scientific. So I think we're naturally more open to there may be something else slightly more powerful than us and maybe we should dive into that a little bit more yeah definitely and i read that your diet change raw vegan diet reiki treatment sun and meditation retreats visualization of breaking down cancer cells sending out white light like you wouldn't have done correct me if i'm wrong if you didn't get the cancer you wouldn't have done any of this i think that's probably right and i think i suspect i would have done it later I was always on that pathway, but I think that was the catalyst to I need to really answer my true calling. And if you want, if I was saying this to someone, a client say, this is what your soul's looking for. Like we can trash our emotions every second of the day by using our analytical mind, but actually we need to sit and stop and say, what am I actually, what am I designed to do here? What do I enjoy doing? And I think that's the And sometimes adversity does shake our foundations and make us move. But sometimes we don't need that major adversity in our life to change our foundation and change our life completely with a, a total 180 reversal as well. Are you still practicing those type of things as well? Like how have you incorporated sort of those into your lifestyle now after it's been seven years? Yeah. I have a daily meditation practice, which I generally do first thing in the morning for about 20 minutes. And that's a, it's a breath work practice as well. And the most important part of that meditation practice for me is to calibrate where I'm at. And this is part of what I train people as well is energy. Like everything we do is in it is based on energy. Money is energy. We as cellular human beings, we're an animal, it's all energy based, right? If we have low energy, we're going to be in a bad mood. If we have high energy, we're going to be in excessive high mood. If you go and take caffeine and alcohol and drugs, you're going to have a full sense of a high mood. So everything's related to energy. So one of the things that helps me to do is say, Okay, you wake up in the morning, you think good, 
sit and meditate. No, oh no, I can feel there's some tension. I'm anxious about something today or something's disturbed me. And I have to then hook into that and let that go so that I can get a better quality of day. And this is one of the things I share with people as well when I work with them is that to understand their, to calibrate this level of energy. Because if you're going to go into, say the typical example, I'll make it very quick is you wake up seven o'clock on Monday morning and you feel, yeah, I'm good. And you get on the, if you're commuting, so you get on a train or a bus and someone coughs in your face and you go, so he's puts you in a bad space. You open, go to work, you open your laptop, nine o'clock, you get a message from the boss, which came in on Friday saying, where's the report? You fire some horrible missive back and your day's unraveling already, right? I'm sure everyone's been there. Whereas, and then you, it unravels. The boss explains, I was just asking where it is. I wasn't having a go at you. It's just a question. Like there's no blame attached. Just let me know what's going on. So of course, then you go home at the end of the day and you have an argument with your boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, husband, wife, whoever it happens to be your friend. If you do this little exercise, what you realize is the reason you're actually, the whole day started like that is because say you, you were exhausted over the weekend, you did something for a friend at the end of last week, or you went to an event where you're already exhausted. So you depleted yourself even more. You didn't recharge because you went and had a really busy weekend. So here you are, you've had no sleep, you're stressed, you're anxious. Your body is telling you we're not feeling good today, but you haven't listened to it, right? You haven't tapped into it. So this little meditation breathwork exercise makes you I realize, okay, I'm not feeling good. So what am I going to do about that? I might do 10 minutes of yoga. I might go for a walk. I'm going to do something to change the way I feel so that my mood state becomes six out of 10, not below five. So that when I do get on that train or that bus and I see that person coughing, I'm going to walk into a different carriage. I'm going to stand further away. Or when I get that email from the boss, I'm just going to pick up the boss and make a phone, make a phone call and say, what's going on? What do you need? Otherwise I'm going to react completely differently to the way I would have done if I hadn't done that exercise in the first place. Yes, yeah, so the app is, that's not my app, that's actually an Aussie guy called Christopher Plowman who's been on my show, but it is a, it's a meditation app and those courses are on there. There's some training on there and that's a beautiful app because it's free. And me and my family for years have listened to meditations before we go to sleep. One thing that I've heard you say before, and I think exactly what you're talking about then to people understand the point was you're talking about getting yourself in a heart set instead of a mindset, because what happens is we walk around unconsciously, mentally in, in the mind. So we're so busy, social media, this, that, and the other, we're always thinking, but getting yourself connected with your body and getting yourself in a heart set. And it's instead of reacting through the day, you're responding during the day. I think that's so important. And we're missing that, that connection to our body. So slowing down, having the meditation or whatever your process is, but just connecting breath work. It doesn't matter what the process is, just connect this to the heart and then you'll have a better day instead of just going unconsciously in the mind all day. Anyway, that you can expand on that if you like, but yeah, I've heard you talk about heart set before. Yeah, hard set. Yeah, that's exactly right. And if you look at, as I say, coming from Australia, we look at the experiential side. But a lot of people nowadays in the Western world they want science, they want facts. So neuroscience now helps us prove with people like Joe Dispenza and Gaia and these apps like that exactly how this works. And there are, there are ten thousand chemical markers in your heart which your brain cannot access unless your heart is connected. So when you breathe through your heart and you feel gratitude and you feel love and kindness and empathy, these chemical markers are released. You can't do that by thinking. So the whole process of neuroscience is how do we, so when people will say to you, I feel stuck or frozen or lost, or I can't think straight, it's because their prefrontal cortex is basically shutting them down. saying we're not gonna allow you to do anything because <laughs> your body's exhausted. And that's very frustrating. So we have to, as you say, Michael, slow down in order to start connecting and reconnecting with the heart to get into a place is called a place called coherence where our mind and our heart is coherent with each other. So I would describe it as a human operating system. We've been programmed to only turn the laptop on, right? And that's it to do everything in our life. So imagine your laptop does everything for you, which is our, of course, our brain, our logical, our, our analytical thinking mind because that's what pays the bills, because that's what the value is. Dollar equals thought. And we've lost this animalistic instinct to feel. I think Jeff Bezos says his greatest decisions come from a place of instinct, not analysis and intuition. 
Yeah, and it's something that we need to tap into as well and take chances and bets on ourselves because your body knows more than sometimes your brain knows. So the intuition is a real thing. They say your gut is your second brain, but I think your heart is your number one. Your Apparently, isn't the heart gives out a stronger signal than the brain or something like that? On an electromagnetic basis, I'll have to go and look. But yes, and on the vib- we give off a vibrational frequency, right? And when we don't connect with our heart, that frequency is going to be much lower than it is when we're feeling in an upper mood state. We're feeling a natural euphoria. And so the whole premise of this is that we want to go through life in a place of homeostasis, which means harmony. If we are balanced between heart and mind or chemically and our body is balanced with the right oxygen, hydration, nutrition, then we have a better chance of living a happy, longer life. We don't get extreme. So when you see people celebrate and they do the big, celebrate, they do the big run, they go off on a bender for days, there's a natural crash that comes with that. Celebration is fine, but also it means that when we have really crisis in our life we don't go into a state of depression as a result because we're experiencing the extreme low we want to stay a place where when things hit us we can manage them easily and move on even the most extreme levels of grief and there's lots of research into this as well and we're going to have time for that but there's a lot of research into super survivors which is based around proximity of time to getting help and experiencing gratitude in terms of accelerating the recovery journey So all of these, as you rightly say, these are fundamental, but we can't go into a corporation and teach how to connect to your heart. There are businesses which do that. They want to know how do I perform at my peak? The reality is you're not going to perform at your peak if you're only using your brain. You have to understand that why won't I only perform at my peak? If I'm just sitting at my desk bashing away on a computer all day long, because there's no connection and there's no observation, you're not, you're going to miss the opportunity that flies in front of you. You're going to miss the red flag that pops up and go, something's wrong. Something's off with this because you're going to ignore it because the, the, you're told to keep going. It is actually not using this human operating system efficiently at all. Yeah. It's, we get so, uh, we waste our time in quantity sometimes it's all about quantity numbers output never really about quality and i was listening to a podcast recently with david goggins and they talked about his morning routine and he spends like six hours on the body stretching all this kind of stuff and the person said where where do you find time for business and he said you got to cap success and it was just like you got to cap it and at the end of the day you got the three buckets health wealth relationships you got to, some people burn themselves out because they're trying so much and they're trying to do so much, but they're never really putting the quality work in. They're always trying to put the quantity in there as well. Really just interesting stuff. But I want to switch gears a little bit and get a little bit selfish and talk about tech startups and entrepreneurs. I know you're into that as well. I'm involved in a tech startup at the moment, which is very exciting. and Hopefully it will be a unicorn business in seven years and reading the book, Billion Dollar Apps. And I've been through startup failures as well. What are some of the reasons why startups fail but what are some of the traits of why startups succeed as well and what are things that you look for in the founders and or trends so just an oddball question but let's talk about tech startups i got 60 seconds to answer that one yeah good one okay first of all as we all know we don't really look at product we look at something i learned very much very early days as an investor and as an investee that the product's interesting but they really want the people if you've got a if you've got a really good cohesive team that is able to be coached that is far more valuable than a product right so that's the first thing for startup founders in terms of this goes right back to the point about red flags intuition you've got to be absolutely on the ball the entire time with what's going on i was helping a business which had a one billion dollar valuation and they had a just they was was having a conversation about it they said can you help i said sure what's the problem was the problem with their raising money because they had a dispute amongst the shareholders. I said, well, where's your documentation? We don't have any. How many shareholders you got? 32. So you've got 32 shareholders who are all at war and you've got no documentation you're trying to raise 50 million. You're not going to do it because they got slack. They got so excited by the idea of this vision and they had a contract. You know, it, the business was legitimate and a really good cause. They just got really slack and these were highly experienced business owners. Entrepreneurs, they weren't coming from the corporate world. They were highly expensive because they got so excited, they forgot the documentation. Like when I see a new technology, you've got a high, you've got a high growth tech company. The first thing I do 
goes back to my legal days. I want to go and see the IP agreements because you might not have any technology. I was advising a company last week and I said, show me the moral rights clause in your contracts. They don't have any. Moral rights clause for the audience means that when you work for somebody else, you give away your intellectual property to that organization. So if you work for Google and you invent Google number three, that's owned by them, not you. <laughs> right? But if you don't have that clause in your contract, you're stuffed, right? Because they get it. So the first things I do is look for the technical intakes of the people. Like, can I work with these people? Are they open to being coached? Are they open to advice? What's their technical level of integrity? Are they sloppy or are they really good at it? Do they really understand the, what the, it means to lay the foundations of a business? Then we look particularly in, in tech world is we have to look at product market. So that obviously has to go hand in hand. But one of the biggest failures of high growth tech companies is they're so obsessed by product they don't understand marketing or sales, particularly if the owners are engineers and they're product obsessed because they don't understand it because they iterate and they over iterate constantly, right? Is get the product into the market, find a customer, make your first dollar of sale and make your first dollar of profit. Then you have a business when you make your first dollar of profit. Until then, it's just an idea. It's a concept. It doesn't mean, I mean, I know it took Bezos 10 years, I think, to make Amazon profitable, but he had the business was generating cash. It just wasn't generating any profit because of the amount of debt and everything else and the systems and he was expanding rapidly, but he had a lot of cash to enable him to do that. Most startups have a cash poor, right? So they burn a huge amount of money on product iteration because they're scared of putting the product to market. I was advising or one of my podcast guests and he came on to explain how, why the business fell over and he had 800,000 subscribers in the app store. 80 million visits on it. He was the darling of Apple in the world of meditation. I get highly commercial, highly critically successful. They took their eye off the ball on the money. They knew it wasn't generated. It was a free freemium service. They knew it wasn't there. They kept building. They had this incredible audience, but they couldn't sell it to anybody. Shut it. That's a big failure. And it's because they didn't lean in to where the business wasn't working. I spoke to a lot of people that say you spend 90% of the time on where the business is failing, not 90% of the time where the business is winning and you'll grow and succeed. So it's, it's a tough world, tech startups, and it's very exciting. That's what we see a lot of. It's in, even at the unicorn level, Michael, I had a, there's a, a lovely lady who came on the show who had, um, a, was it an esports business, FanDuel. It was the biggest esports business in the States and it was bought by Patty Power. But I think the price was over, it was a billion dollar business they haven't received a dollar. You think, how do these incredibly smart people who created the biggest esports business on the planet not receive a dollar? Because the paperwork went against them. So basically the new owner devalued the business and the earner got reduced to zero. In a nutshell, you, people can go and listen to it. So here you have the other end of the scale where you've got your unicorn, but the founders end up with nothing. How is that possible? Law, <laughs> contracts, documentation, trust. So they, they did all this work, but they got screwed. They got screwed by the VC, yeah. And it happens all, look, it's, this is, I'm relating the story, but effectively they got screwed by the VC, apparently. And it happens a lot. So again, this goes back to, so to, to what I teach now is this program called Reclaim, and it's part of the other program I have, which is the business of life, which if you want to go and do this, before you even start, putting a dollar or a thought into it, you really need to understand how this system works because it's designed to protect you. It's designed to allow you to work 17 hour days. It's designed to tell you I've had enough 17 hour days. I need to sleep. It's designed to pick up on, I don't need to do that deal with that person because it's off, right? It's designed to protect you and it's designed to give you as much wealth and abundance as you possibly need. Because when your system works right, in harmony with each other, what happens? You can manifest just like that. Opportunities will come straight into you and you'll know whether they're right or they're wrong. But if you don't do that, your mind, your brain will allow you to create, but you're going to miss so many different things. You're going to miss so many red flags. Your idea may even be the wrong idea at the beginning because you're so obsessed with it. 
So what I say to them now is like you were talking about when they fall off the cliff. We want to get them to fall off the cliff, but we also want to teach the young ones. This is what you need to know before. You say you want to own a business, great. Learn this before you learn the business, because then you'll have a much better chance of success when you have a business. And it's all about having those micro failures and those wheels coming off early in your life. So the later, the later in life that they don't fall off when things get really serious as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot of research into older stage. Older entrepreneurs tend to be really good because they have tended to have lots of failures, but also entrepreneurs coming out of the corporate world have a lot of failures as well because they follow corporate principles. They don't follow lean principles or startup principles. So that's a big thing. So this is because you've got a guy who's come out of what man or woman who's come out of News Corp or Google or Atlassian and only had a corporate career. Last they're going to be short anyway. If they come out of Atlassian. <laughs> but the point is, don't believe they're going to make a good founder because if they've only been used to enterprise level architecture and enterprise level systems, they don't know how to sell a widget to a human being on the street. They've got no idea. But the failures, if they've had lots of them, those micro failures, and failure is not even a word that we want to use in investment terms anymore because it's just a human experience. Put it down to an experience. You've got to, the whole process of iteration is 80% failure, <laughs> right? Or is it even 90% as you say, Michael? So if you don't allow that to happen and you can't allow that to happen if you're obsessed only with success. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much more to unpack about this and we can have conversations offline about technical things on this. But yeah, thank you for unpacking and sharing that as well. Where can people find more about yourself and where do you spend most of the time socially? I know you've got the podcast through there, but where can people find you? The best place to find me is through my website, which is just edandrew.com. I'm going to be creating more. I'm not a huge social media player. Um, I'm a consumer of it, but I need to put more out there. So I have Instagram. I probably, out of all the channels, I probably hang out on Instagram more than anywhere else. And that's just Ed Andrew. And the YouTube is going to have to grow because as we discussed earlier, we need to get good at marketing. Here's the thing on that. You can grow highly successful businesses without enormous social media followings. It just depends on where your client is and how you want to get them. You can do it organically or you can do it with money. I've got a friend who sold a $70 million business. He didn't have even have any social media accounts. Yeah, well, yeah, the sometimes people forget that the online business is not always cracked up to what it be. It's hard work, like the offline business is sometimes more profitable than the online business. So kids these days forget about brick and mortar stores and brick and mortar businesses and old school businesses. And they just keep thinking about the new stuff as well. But yeah, we could go on and on forever. I do apologize. We didn't even get deep into the book as well about the recruitment industry, explain head hunting, being in the top 1%, writing your killer resume. I had all these notes for it. We can save that for a later date. I know you're working on a another book that will come out later in the track so we'll definitely have you on to my audience out there yeah go check out ed his podcast as well he's got some amazing guests and stuff on there as well and you've got a lot of programs on your websites too certified transformational life coach what other programs have you got through there ed, as well oh yeah i changed it and do it me last week today so yeah i might have caught you out there my god so basically but yeah the yep. main program, the business of life, is what we've been talking about. So whether you're a CEO, whether you're an entrepreneur, it's mainly for business owners, but obviously executives and people starting their journey. And it's to teach them exactly what we've been talking about today. So how do we prepare ourselves for the battle which lies ahead? Because everybody, even these wonderful people who are love in doing their van life, they still got to pay to put fuel in the van. They've still got to pay for their insurance. They've still got to put food on the table. Right. So the concept is how do we build the life that we want to lead and the person we want to be and then layer in the business which supports that, not the other way around. Correct. Not the other way around. Yeah. That's this notion of reclaim, which is the business. We need to reclaim our life and then build everything which pays for our life around that. Not the other way around. And then the transformational coach is where I certify and train people in the art of what I do. So I have clients who've come through the program, they've come out the other side, they've, they've, their business has gone through the roof and it's like, okay, the business is making a lot of money, but what I really want to do is help people like you. So right now I can certify you in that process. But just before we wrap up, when you talked about bricks and mortar as well, my, I, me and my wife, created a, a bricks and mortar store for our girls who are 12 and 13. So it's their businesses. 
<laughs> it's called the secret life of sweets which won't mean anything to anyone outside of australia but basically they have an online lolly store and we go to the markets that's awesome so tomorrow i'll be going to umundi markets which is the biggest markets in australia up here and outside new so they get about 1.5 million people a year and i will be there at six o'clock in the morning setting up on my saturday morning because they're excited about learning about the value of the money they also have horses and we say right can you pay for your own horses? Let's see if you can actually have a business which pays for your own horses. So it's bricks and mortar. Yeah, and I've always wanted to have a cash generated business. So, you know, it's fun. It might not be fun for a long time, but at the moment. Well, you gotta teach, you got to teach the kids to take over the businesses so then you can relax even more and get those 17 hour days down to a couple of hours, which you're probably doing. I don't do many. And what do I don't do a lot the next day? We, you, you do the same, Michael. You've got five businesses to run. We know when you need to put the drive in and other times where you can go, I'm just going to the beach for the afternoon because I'm done. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. I'm getting to that stage of stop working 17 hours and really putting the things into place. But yeah, I'm sure we'll have uh, some great conversations offline. But to all your ones out there, check out Andrew. He's got some great stuff out there and some 150 episodes on your podcast as well. So definitely subscribe to the podcast and I might be able to give some tips on some YouTube going forward. But yeah, thanks for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast and we'll speak very shortly. So have a great day and enjoy the Nooses weather today. I'm sure it'll be lovely up there. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure to talk to you always. No problems at all. All right, speak to you soon. All right, bye.